Good evening. Once again, Kenny Jacobs from Bloomington, Illinois. I'm going to do a video this evening talking about current events as it relates to Bible prophecy. But first, a word of prayer. Father, there's so much happening and so few are ready. I ask you to use this video in a miraculous way to reach the lost and to prepare people for what is coming. And bless those who hear this message. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Okay, uh, again, there's a lot of news stories I want to cover. And, and quite frankly, they're all very, very important. And they cover all sorts of <clears throat> aspects of Bible prophecy because there's so many things happening. All the signs that Jesus said to look for are happening on a, on a daily basis, on a global scale. So... I have technology stories that pertain to Mark of the Beast type technology, <clears throat> Temple Mount stories, uh, asteroids, so I got all sorts of things. So let's get into it. Uh, <clears throat> and I also want to, uh, the final story tonight I want to cover is kind of a continuation of last night's video and I want to get into a little bit more on that and Mystery Babylon. So let's, let's, let's get into this. The first news story out of a rut shove it today. Jews go on the offensive on the Temple Mount. So steadfast upholding of principles is the only way to win. Again, it's a very, very interesting news story. It's very, very important because, as you know, there has not been a temple, a Jewish temple on the Temple Mount since A.D. 70 when the Roman Empire destroyed it. And Jesus prophesied in Matthew 24 that that would happen. And it did, exactly like he said. Uh, but it's also prophesied that there will be a temple again, a third temple for the Antichrist to enter and desecrate. Daniel 9.27, Jesus himself discusses it. Matthew 24, verse 15. And the Apostle Paul addresses it in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3 and 4. And then John in the book of Revelation, and Revelation chapter 11. So, we do know there's going to be a temple, and again, it's the Jewish people are really tired of not being able to go up onto the Temple Mount and pray, um, and, and it seems like this status quo on the Temple Mount, which has certainly been a big issue, is kind of coming to a head. <clears throat> it says, a few days ago, we published on Eretz Sheva an expose about UNESCO's new policy regarding the Temple Mount, meant to strip the Jews of their historic legal, and natural rights over their most important holy city. The Sanhedrin and other Jewish groups then drafted a letter of protest to the UN's cultural office. It showed the way the state of Israel should fire back at their enemies. A special court will be formed <clears throat> at Mount Zion based on the foundation of Sanhedrin to sue UNESCO. The Jewish document, get this, it says the Jewish document demands revocation of the declaration regarding Islam's rights on the Temple Mount and replacing it with a truthful declaration or else face legal prosecution. They charge UNESCO of acting like a tool of belligerent Islam which recklessly and maliciously proclaimed that the entire mount with the Al-Aqsa Mosque and all rights belong to the Muslims including the surroundings of so-called ancient Jerusalem in an Islamic Heritage Site uh, in the declaration publish, publicized on, in, on April 28, 2015. <clears throat> now it goes on to say, Therefore they demand from UNESCO recognition of the Temple Mount as the holiest site of the Jewish people and a call to end the racial discrimination against the Jews on the Temple Mount and support for equality of rights in the Temple Mount for Jews in all matters of religion and worship. <clears throat> if you do not do this, you are liable to be cha charged with anti-Semitism, which is a criminal offense in most countries of the world. If you do make the requested declaration, you'll be clarifying that you do not support racial discrimination against Jews. It says, otherwise, it continues, we will be forced to sue them as well, without fear, as it is written in the prophecies of the Jewish prophets. And they quote, it says, and liberators shall come up on Mount Zion, to judge the mount of Esau, and the kingdom shall be the Lord's. Obadiah 121. 
says, Israel's passive policy connected with Israel's denial of the Temple Mount's centrality in the conflict helped the Palestinian Arabs win the UNESCO race and allowed the rewriting of history of Palestine. The New Jewish Group's initiative shows the other way to deal with enemies without fear, but proud and steady. This is how anti-Semitic lies and hatred will be defeated. The Jewish people will live. Very interesting news story. Uh, you can see that the Jewish people are tired of the status quo on the Temple Mount and are beginning to demand their rights to worship and pray at the Temple Mount. And eventually then there will be a third temple. Again, just a major sign that we're living in the very last days. And the final seven-year period will, end, will begin when the Antichrist confirms a covenant with many that in all likelihood will guarantee the security of Israel and allow them to build the temple. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, there's another story about what's going on in Israel with the new government, uh, the new coalition... Netanyahu was just re-elected, and he's been putting together his coalition. This is out of a, a Rosh Hashanah today. Herzog, Isaac Herzog, vows to cripple Netanyahu's coalition. He says, we will not let you lead. You will not be able to function. The labor head threatens. says, new elections are better than Likud rule. He says, Opp opposition leader Itzhak Herzog is looking to supplant Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu calling Monday for repeat general elections. That's amazing. I mean, they just had the elections, and now Herzog is saying, we are not going to allow Netanyahu to lead and calling for repeat general elections. And, and you know, all I can say is, Jesus said in the last days, there would be wars and rumors of wars, nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom, that there would be distress of nations with perplexity. Look what's happened through the, off the entire Middle East with all the overthrows of leaders and governments there still going on. Uh, we just had this situation in Israel, and now even right after the election, they're already calling for a different government, another election. Bashar al-Assad in Syria has been using chemical weapons on his people again. And it looks like he's on his last days in Isaiah 17, 1, the prophecy of Damascus that would be, no longer would be a city, it would be a ruinous heap. <clears throat> There's a good chance Bashar al-Assad in Syria will fall soon. What is that going to do? And who's going to take over there? Will the Antichrist rise out of all of this? Very, very interesting to see. Um... Uh, but the, certainly with what's going on all around the world, the stress of nations is certainly happening uh, like never before. Um, let's go on. Uh, here's a here's a interesting technology article. Tracking kids via microchip can't be far off, says expert. It says, it's a thought that is just a little too Orwellian for most people. Putting a microchip inside your body. But there are people who are already doing just that already. It says, for most of those who have, it's a matter of convenience. Now they can log on to their computer, lock, run, lock their front door, or even start the car with a wave of a microchip implanted in their hand. Now let's take the technology one step further. What if you could implant a, a chip in your child, which could help him, which, which could help bring him or her home in the event that they were lost or worse? kidnapped. Experts are working on that possibility right now. There are, they are already working on products you can buy like watches and bracelets or tracking bugs to drop into the backpack, which can be tracked by GPS. But tracking a microchip placed inside a human body is another matter. It might be just one of those, I might just be one of those mothers who would do it, says Trish Dick Dickerson. Her three and a half year old son Elliot never stops. He has no fear of anybody or anything. He has no stranger danger. Dickerson said, though, one day, I, I, I microchipped my dog. Why couldn't I microchip my son? Uh, wow. This is, uh, Stuart Lipoff said that the, that's the ick factor most people cannot get over. Lip, Lipoff is an electronics engineer who is an expert in RFID technology. RFID is what operates the chips in our pets as well as the chips in our smart keys, credit cards, fobs for electronic locks, and dozens of other 
uh, electronic devices. Uh, well, first of all, as you can see, that technology is already here. People already have it. Um, and whether or not people like it or want to have it or think it's a good idea or think it's a bad idea, the fact of the matter is someday it's going to be forced on the entire planet. Revelation chapter 13, verse 16 and 17 says, And he causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads, and that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. The mark of the beast will be a, techno techno a technology that will be a commerce type of technology. It'll, it'll allow buying and selling, but it'll also hold your health records, GPS tracking. It's already here, and whether or not people like it, eventually it will be forced on the entire world. And at that point, if you take that mark, at that point, when it, when it is part of, when it actually is the mark of the beast, you will lose your soul for all eternity. If you do not take the mark of the beast, you'll all likelihood starve to death or be caught and beheaded. That's exactly what the Bible says. Praise God, that's not for the church. And I have several videos about that you know, on my channel, so I'm not going to get into that at the moment. But, again, people are like this lady. I might just be one of those mothers who would do it. It's, and it's gonna, and right now, people look at it as cutting-edge technology. It's cool. It's convenient. And that's the way it's being marketed. At some point, you're not gonna have a, people are not going to have a choice. Well, let's go to another uh, news story. Denmark. Denmark is set to become the first cashless nation. Uh, the only way you can control all buying and selling would be to get rid of cash. Make it a chip in your hand. By the way, it does say in the King James Version of the Bible, which, I, which I'm reading, the mark is in the right hand or in the foreheads, and I believe the King James Version has it right. Other versions say on the right hand or on the forehead, but we're seeing the implant happening now. Um... Denmark set to become the first country in the world to make cashless payments obsolete. It says Denmark is, to, is on track to become the world's first cashless nation with its government pushing to free some stores, restaurants, petrol stations from accepting cash payments. The proposal to scrap cra uh, cash transactions is part of a package of cost-saving measures uh, being introduced by the Danish election. Uh, it is understood the government is hoping to get rid of the option to get rid of the option to pay by cash by as early as 2016. Nearly a third of all Danish citizens prefer to use uh, the, this bank's official app, Mobile Pay, to pay for services and transactions, and it is expected that the proposal will be met with little opposition. So society has changed so much; there's no longer a need for requirements on cash payments. Plus, cash has been tremendously expensive to handle due to security reasons. However, there are fears that with electronic transactions, the risk of fraud will rise. And they go on and talk about that. Um, it says the technology is available in Australia through banks, businesses, and PayPal are, pay are paving the way individually, making it more difficult to understand. It says um, other digital pay options such as Google Wallet, Apple's Passbook and England's uh, PAM are starting to become more commonplace with experts predicting that Nordic nations will become cashless by 2030. I can assure you that it'll be cashless long before 2030 because it's going to happen midway through the final seven-year period of time and it looks like we're on the verge of the final seven-year period of time happening right now. Uh, and the, the way technology is, is, is expanding and, and, and knowledge is being increased, like Daniel 12.4 says, that technology is already here and it won't take them long to get it set up. Uh, <clears throat> let's move on. Asteroid, a mile wide, to hurdle past Earth in 72 hours. It's amazing how many stories in the last year I've covered about Close calls with asteroids. Didn't hear about that five years ago, very often, if ever. But now we're hearing it all the time, and they keep getting closer and closer, and we get very little, if any, warning. Um, which is very interesting. Asteroid a mile wide 
to hurtle past Earth in 72 hours as experts warn of mass extinction. Um, a colossal asteroid hurtling through space is feared to be one of the biggest ever to threaten a collision with Earth. Now, I've read this article. It's not going to hit Earth. It's going to come very, very close. It says the a gigantic missile thought to measure almost a mile across will brush closer than previous monsters, which have sparked a global panic. Worried astronomers warned uh, that 1999 FN 53, which is an eighth of the size of Mount Everest, will skim the Earth in three days. A collision would be nothing short of catastrophic triggering mass destruction, earthquakes, and global extinction. Uh, the monster is more than ten times bigger than any other meteorite, meteorites currently visible on NASA's near-Earth object radar. It is also double the size of the gargantuan 2014 YB35, which had astronomers around the world watching the skies just in March. I'm telling you, these are happening more and more frequently and are getting closer and closer. Experts warn a collision would trigger an explosive similar to, to millions of tons of TNT and would be capable of killing 1.5 billion people. Uh, it's traveling faster than 30,000 miles per hour and will brush terrifyingly close to Earth on Tuesday. Now, again, these are happening at a more frequent uh, pace and getting closer and closer. And what's interesting here is they say that it is it is a an eighth the size of Mount Mount. You hear that word Mount Everest? Let's go to Revelation chapter eight, starting at verse seven. The first angel sounded, and there flowed, there followed hail and fire mingled with blood, and they were cast upon the earth, and the third part of the trees was burned up, and all green grass was burned up. And get this, and the second angel sounded, and as it were a great mountain burning with fire was cast into the sea, and the third part of the sea became blood, and the third part of the creatures which were in the sea and had life died, and the third part of the ships were destroyed, and the third angel sounded, and there fell a great star from heaven, burning as it were a lamp, and it fell upon the third part of the rivers, and, and upon the fountains of the waters. And the name of the star is called Wormwood, and the third part of the waters became Wormwood. And many men died of the waters, because they were made bitter. Now this one is not going to hit the earth, I don't believe. However, they're comparing it to Mount Everest. Everest. In Revelation 8.8, and the second angel sounded, and, and as it were, a great mountain burning with fire was cast into the sea. God is trying to wake people up and get your attention, but people still don't seem to be listening and paying any attention. But soon, during the final seven-year period, these things are going to start hitting the earth. I know it would be a fact, because that's exactly what the Bible says is going to happen. All right. Uh, all right, now let's get on to um, a follow-up to some stuff I've done about the Vatican and Mystery Babylon. Um, and again, we know Pope Francis is uh, on this po uh, stamping out poverty agenda uh, in the United Nations, uh, uh, sustainable development, climate change, and all of that. Um, so let's go to this article. Um, headline is, uh, Pope Francis, Pope Francis's poverty agenda draws President Obama. <clears throat> this is out of Time Magazine today. This is poverty in the United States is a topic that is often... Avoided, but on Washington, on Monday in Washington, a diverse group of 120 political, religious, and civic leaders, including President Obama, will gather at Georgetown University for a three day Catholic Evangelical Leadership Summit on the issue, in large part thanks to Pope Francis. Uh, this, this summit is a direct response to Pope Francis's challenge to place the lives and dignity of the poor at the center of religious and public life. The event has two main goals, making overcoming poverty a national priority and moral imperative, and breaking down the walls between people who focus almost entirely on family life and people who focus almost completely on economic life. Anyone who is poor or works with poor knows that a child's prospects are affected both by the choices of her parents and the policies of her government. Um, 
It says the summit organizers did not ask Pope Francis to participate. He, his continued emphasis on the poor has helped to shift the national tone on the issue. We think he has already sent a very clear message. Uh, it says the gathering mixes together public and private sessions so that participants can talk openly about more controversial political challenges and issues like immigration, race, family planning, and incarceration. Ironically, there is more consensus, more bipartisan cooperation, in some ways more unity in the religious community about global poverty than poverty in our own country. And we are hoping to address that. The polarization is real, and the religious community has a unique opportunity, particularly Catholics and Evangelicals, to challenge people's conscience and also to bridge some of the ideological and political division. And then they go down talking more about uh, this, the, the state of the economy in America right now. It says their timing and the timing of the summit more broadly is, is strategic. Pope Francis will visit the U.S. in September in the middle of a heated presidential primary contest. His name and presence will almost certainly give poverty a major boost in the national conversation. Now, what's interesting is he and Barack Obama and the United Nations are all promoting the same agenda of climate change, eradicating poverty, uh, and quite frankly, a new world order. But uh, again, first of all, I want to say there's nothing wrong with taking care of the poor. Obviously, we should all help take care of the poor, without a doubt. But uh, my problem with this is there's no way they're ever going to eradicate poverty, and nor do they really care or want to. Putting all of the world in, under a one-world monetary system, a one-world economic system, one-world government, one-world religion will not do anything to eradicate poverty. In fact, the Bible makes it very, very clear that that's going to get much worse. And there will be famines and pestilence and people starving, and, and that's exactly what's going to happen. But I also know for a fact that even if, even if it was all good intentions, even if these people really cared and really wanted to help global poverty... I know for a fact that they will never be able to eradicate poverty because Jesus himself said so. Let's look at Matthew chapter 26, verse 11. For ye have the poor always with you, <clears throat> but me we have you have not always. If Jesus says there will always be poor, then there will always be poor. Yes, we should do everything we can to help the poor as we can, but a one world government trying to force the re-distribution uh, of wealth and controlling who can buy or sell through a mark that is coming, through a one world monetary system headed up by the Antichrist and false prophet given their seat and great authority by Satan himself is certainly not the answer. And uh, it's, just, it's just not, it's certainly not, definitely not the answer. Uh, another a couple of stories here. I want, to get, I want to get into one really important one here in just a minute. Um, but um, another headline I saw today was Pope Francis is to meet with Mahmoud Abbas on Saturday, uh, the Palestinian leader. Um, and it's just very, very interesting to me because Pope Francis seems to have a lot in common and he seems to hit it off very well with people like Mahmoud Abbas, Barack Hussein Obama, the United Nations, and the Castros in Cuba. Yet the conservative Christians have a major problem with this guy. It's time to wake up. Pope Francis is evil. He's not what he th claims to be. And I, I, mean, I know calling a pope evil can make people mad, but I'm going to tell you the truth. Uh, let's move on to one other story I want to get into. Because again, Pope Francis keeps talking about poverty and eradicating poverty. Yet... The Vatican, well, let's just read this headline. The Catholic Church is the biggest financial power on earth. Um, I don't see the Vatican liquidating their assets to help eradicate poverty. Uh, the Catholic Church is the biggest financial power on earth. Have you ever wondered how wealthy the church really is? In his book, The Vatican Billions, uh, writer Ar Avro Manhattan gives us a glimpse of the true financial worth of the Catholic Church. The Vatican has large investments with the Rothschilds of Britain, France, and America, with the Hambros Bank, with the Credit Suisse in London and Zurich. Sorry, my Google just crashed again. One moment.
<clears throat> okay. Um, the Vatican has large investments with the Credit Suisse in London and Zurich. In the United States, it has large investments with the Morgan Bank, the Chase Manhattan Bank, the First National Bank of New York, the Bankers Trust Company, and others. The, Vaticans have, has, the Vatican has billions of shares in the most powerful international, billions of shares with a B, in the most powerful international corporations such as Gulf Oil, Shell, General Motors, Bethlehem Steel, General Electric, International Business Machines, TWA, etc. Some idea of the real estate and other forms of wealth controlled by the Catholic Church may be gathered by the remark of a member of the New York Catholic Conference, namely that his church probably ranks second only to the United States government in total annual purchase. Another statement made by a nationally syndicated Catholic priest perhaps is even more telling. The Catholic Church, he said, must be the biggest corporation in the United States. We have a branch office in every neighborhood. Our assets and real estate holdings must exceed those of Standard Oil, AT&T, and the U.S. Steel combined. And our roster of dues-paying members must be second only to the tax rolls of the United States government. The Catholic Church, once all our assets have been put together, is the most formidable stockbroker in the world. The Vatican, independently of each successive pope, has been increasingly orient orientated towards the U.S., the Wall Street Journal said that the Vatican's financial deals in the U.S. alone were so big that very often it sold or bought gold in lots of a million or more dollars at one time. The Vatican's treasure of solid gold has been estimated by the United Nations World Magazine to amount to several billion dollars. A large bulk of this is stored in gold ingots in the U.S. Federal Reserve Bank, while banks in England and Switzerland hold the rest. But this is just a small portion of the wealth of the Vatican, which in the U.S. alone is greater than that of the five wealthiest giant corporations of the country. When, it, when to that it is added all the real estate, property, stocks, and shares abroad, then the staggering accumulation of wealth of the Catholic Church becomes as formidable as to defy any rational assessment. Other articles also go in and talk about all the art and all the stuff that they have there that's not even, they can't even put a price on it. Uh, it says the Catholic Church is the biggest financial power, wealth accumulator, and property owner in existence. She is a greater possessor of material riches than any other single institution, corporation, giant bank, giant trust, government, or state of the whole globe. Uh, all right. Now, as usual, I'm going to put links to all of these articles in the description box so that you can read these articles yourself. Um... Let's go to Revelation chapter 17 and 18 because I've done, and I've done several other videos on my channel about this that I believe that the Vatican the papacy is Vatican City is Mystery Babylon. So let's read a little bit of Revelation 17 verses uh, 1 through 6. And there came one of the seven angels which had the seven vials and talked with me saying unto me Come hither, I will show unto thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters, with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet collared beast full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet collar, and decked with precious, with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. And upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. And I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. All right, now, let's go... Um, <clears throat> By the way, verse uh, 18 says, Revelation 17, 18 says, And the woman which thou sawest is that great city which reigneth over the kings of the earth. Uh, and verse 9 says, And here is the mind which hath wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sitteth. Rome itself even acknowledges that that stands for Rome. Um, and the great city which reigns over the kings of the earth is Vatican City. It's not just a city, it is its own sovereign country that does reign over the kings 
of the earth. It's arrayed in purple and scarlet. Look at a ceremony, at the, look at a mass at the Vatican, and notice all the purple and scarlet with the bishops and the cardinals. Um, and let's see, and decked with gold and precious stones and having a golden cup in her hand. Watch Pope Francis lift up the golden cup during this during the mass. And look at all the gold and precious stones. Now, let's go to Revelation Revelation chapter 18 because I hear a lot of people teaching all the time that Mystery Babylon is America and it makes no sense. Um, because first of all, America, when they're talking about Mystery Babylon in, verse 7, in Revelation 17, America is not drunk on the blood of the saints and the martyrs of Jesus, first of all. America is not decked in gold, as purple and scarlet with gold and precious stones, and with a golden cup. America is not a great city, like it says in verse 18. But let's go to Revelation 18, verses 2 to 10. And he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon the great has fallen, has fallen, and has become the habitation of devils, and the hold of every foul spirit, and the cage of every unclean and hateful bird. For all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication, and the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, and the merchants of the earth are waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacies. And I heard another voice from heaven, saying, Come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins, and that you receive not of her plagues, for her sins have reached unto heaven, and God hath remembered her iniquities. We stop there for a minute. Come out of her, my people, that you be not partakers of her sins. I do not believe that the Apostle John, writing here in Revelation, I do not believe that God was telling Americans to leave America. That America is Mystery Babylon. That he's calling Christians in America to leave America. I don't see that being the case. He says, but come out of her, my people. People who are in the, in, in, stuck in a false religious system. And that's why it's called fornication. Because it's a false spiritual idolatry. It's a, it is a spiritual adultery. It is a false religious system. And that's why God says, Come out of her, my people, that you be not partakers of her sins. Reward her even as she rewarded you, and double her double according to her works. In the cup which she hath filled, fill, her, fill to her double. There's that cup again showing up. How much she hath glorified herself, and lived deliciously. So much torment and sorrow give her. For she saith in her heart, I sit a queen, and am no widow, and shall see no sorrow. Therefore, shall her plagues come in one day, death and mourning and famine, and she shall be utterly burned with fire, for strong is the Lord God who judgeth her. And the kings of the earth who have committed fornication and lived deliciously with her shall bewail her and lament her when they shall see the smoke of her burning, standing afar off for the fear of her torment, saying, Alas, alas, that great city Babylon, that mighty city, for in one hour is thy judgment come. By the way, let me go there real quickly. I just, I, I just thought of this. Um... 1 Peter, 1 Peter chapter 5. I have heard Catholics who try to say, well, when, when, when Protestants say there's no evidence that Peter was ever in Rome, here's one of the verses they use to prove that he was. They say, um, Peter wrote in 1 Peter chapter 5, he says, The church that is at Babylon, elected together with you, saluteth you, and so doth Marcus my son. They admit right here that Babylon refers to Rome. And they say that because Peter says that in this verse, the church that is at Babylon elected together with you, salute you, that he must, this is in Rome. But then they won't admit, they don't want to admit that they're mystery Babylon. Uh, let's, let's go on. Um, verse 16. And alas, alas, that great city that was clothed in fine linen and purple and scarlet and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls. For in one hour so great riches has come to naught. For every shipmaster and all the company and sh ships and sailors and as many as trade by sea stood afar off. Uh, verse 7, uh, let's see, verse uh, 23 to 24. It's Revelation 18, verse 23 and 24. And the light of a candle shall shine no more at all in thee, and the voice of the bridegroom and of the bride shall be heard no more, no more at all in thee. For thy merchants, which were the great men of the earth, 
for by thy sorceries were all nations deceived. And in her was found the blood of prophets and of saints and of all the slain that were upon the earth. Um, America has not deceived all of the nations, but the false religious system of Catholicism has definitely deceived the nations, and by thy sorceries were all nations deceived. And again, in her was found the blood of the prophets and of the saints. America has not martyred the saints and the prophets, but the Catholic Church did. And it says, all the great riches have been gone in one hour. And I just read the article. The Catholic Church is the biggest financial power on earth. The Vatican is the only entity on the on the planet that matches the description of mystery Babylon and it is a false religious system full of spiritual idol uh, adultery and idolatry and uh, and I'm going to keep calling it out because there are so many people that I that in my family for example that I know love Jesus Christ but they are t are mixed up in in this system, and they I, I pray that they will see that they need Jesus Christ and only Jesus Christ for salvation. And it's amazing to me that again, Archbishop Fulton Sheen, Saint Francis of Assisi, Malachi, other Catholic scholars have said that the final Pope will bring on the destruction of the Church. They say it themselves. And Jesus Christ is not going to destroy his own church. Yet the Catholic Church is even looking for the final guy to destroy the church. And according to the Malachi prophecy, that final guy is Pope Francis. And he's coming to the United Nations in September, the week of the last blood moon. You can't even make this stuff up on the Shemitah year. There's so much going on. The... the the world is, is again de pretty much demanding a two-state solution in Israel, demanding Israel give up land for peace. Pope Francis, the United Nations, trying to, to change the world economy. Wars and rumors of wars, like, <laughs> like uh, spread of terrorism, crazy weather, threat of total global economic collapse. Earthquakes, diverse places, every single sign is here. Every single sign. We are coming down to the very, very end. And it is absolutely time to make sure you are saved. And that you understand that salvation is through Jesus Christ alone. By, we are saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. If you will turn to him. Give your life to him. Repent of your sin and ask him to forgive you and write your name in the Lamb's book of life and save you. He will change you. The Holy Spirit will indwell you and you will be saved. The Bible says that all who call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And Jesus himself said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. And the Bible says that there is one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus why he died for you. The Bible says without the shedding of blood there is no remission of sin. Jesus died for you 2,000 years ago on a cross. He shed his blood for you and, was, and he rose again. And he promised to come back again. And if you will call out to him in faith he will change you and save you. But you're running out of time. Make sure you're ready. Keep looking up. God bless everyone.